Okay, uh, I'll have to look at this because uh, I, I want to be able to remember everything. Uh, a lot of what happened comes out of reflections, maybe helped during the COVID period of isolation about how we experience our respective privilege. Uh, I speak as a very good example of this because essentially I'm just paid to pay to think and to explore things and do this in the company of motivated people. So a lot of the, uh, I think the recognition of this privilege comes in reflection and thinking how do we do things, how do we then try to effect change in our own community and more widely. Uh, a lot of uh, the assumptions in our field of typography are based on legacy concepts, legacy technology, legacy ways of working, and we get trained to do these things. We read these things. We're also in an environment where increasingly, at least bilingual functionally, we read text in English, blogs in English, and that might be our second language, as indeed it is for everyone here and a bit, yeah? But we are all sharing this common terminology that swims around, and it's almost nobody's job to think about it. So what we have is people realizing at some point that something might be wrong with it, or maybe it's out of date, and it usually results in verbal expectorations online and sort of mental burps on social media. Uh, not really very productive. So, as Veronica said, we took a different approach and thought, if this is serious, then we do need to slow down, give space in this reflection. So this took space over a month. Uh, we had three sessions uh, where we uh, started discussing uh, the topic and we sort of had a few starting points, let them the conversation go wherever it would lead us. Uh, we did transcripts, circulated notes on the transcripts each week, so then the following week we had time to reflect on them and take the conversation further. And yesterday morning uh, we were able to get together and have some sort of agreement on how we would handle this. So what I'm going to do is give a little bit of a, uh, a summary of what we went through. Um, some of it might be common ground for a lot of people, some of it might just indicate how a bunch of people who put some time and effort into this took a trajectory through the concepts. I would also again like to recognize uh, Mariko and Chorong who are not here, uh, but their contributions are, I hope, correctly reflected into this. So we started with recognition that uh, the term non-Latin is problematic and uncomfortable for a lot of us and has been for quite a long time. Uh, so we start first by unpacking that. And it's useful to remember that actually it's not a very long term. It was invented in the 70s, 80s, when proprietary typesetting technologies were expanding their work into other uh, writing systems. And it was important to be able to say to engineers and so on, this is not what you're really used to, this is something else and so on. But that's quite important to remember that the world in which that was, uh, that term became, say, established is completely different from ours. It is something where markets were silos, there wasn't any concept of globalization the way we understand it today. Fonts as products were not really independent, easily exchangeable things online. And the concept of a type foundry was also something very different from us now. So uh, it is a very different environment of use. And that is something that uh, has come very much to play now, where we see that the term really is entirely out of context. So it was very useful in shaking quite a few people out of the old and deeply racist terms of exotics and orientals. You don't need to look very far back in the past to find uh, specimens by, for example, Oxford. Uh, to see exotics at OUP. That is well within the 20th century. So it was, in a sense, a useful step forward because it, fo it uh, focused on a technologically different way of seeing a set of writing systems rather than describe with any indirect descriptors what was looking. Uh, since then, everything has changed. And what we've also seen is that there's a very big rise in typography as a subject for education, typeface design as a subject for education, which generates texts. Now, it is a fact, whether we like it or not, that this happens in the Anglosphere in terms of the overwhelming production of texts, which often get translated into other texts because they become 
uh, reference points for educators. So there is a very big uh, set of considerations that have to do with how do these terms get translated or imported. So who does the teaching? Maybe someone in a country that is new in the typographic education field and has also studied themselves in another country and then import their own experience of education into another. So very good intentions that then in a way perpetuate indirectly certain habits. So it's, it's useful before we rush to say apportion blame or anything to have a little bit of uh, understanding of the context in which things develop and understand how perhaps all of this uh, uneasiness of these terms shows us that they are out of date, but perhaps more explicit reflection on behalf of our community uh, is, some, is a good way of addressing this. Uh, our conversation was fascinating because it took different uh, directions in the, in the sessions. The first one was very much about unpacking the terminology. We looked at the function of terms. We started with non-Latin, but the conversation also included other terms. Uh, like a humanist and so on, things that are very European in their, um, in their origins and meaning and might be applied in other environments with completely bogus application. Uh, we looked a lot at the user perspective and that is something that I think has not uh, been done enough where a lot of these terms tend to come from the type manufacturers or the types that include manufacturers rather than necessarily what happens on the ground, where designers uh, work with clients, work with their audiences, and so on. That is something that is important. We also recognize that there is quite a lot of activity in related fields, uh, from linguistics uh, to, uh, um, uh, sorry, to graphematics, uh, where there is quite a substantial body of scientific work where people are studying writing systems. And they don't necessarily talk too much with typeface designers, although in um, less than a month there's a conference on graphematics in Paris where there's quite a lot of activity in this. And they have solved the problem of referring to writing systems by using terms that only refer to the structure and function, the morphology of the writing system. So they might refer to something as syllabic uh, or ideographic and so on, rather than by region or geography or the language that it represents and so on. So it's a much more neutral perspective. That has something that is uh, a strong point in our discussion, that there is a lot to learn from other fields because we are not the only field that is having this kind of reflective conversation with ourselves about how we think about our practice. This really came uh, to quite a fairly high level in the second conversation we had, we really opened up the, the topic and we started tapping into its connection to the wider discourse on decolonization, uh, the discourse on agency, empowerment, uh, equality versus uh, equity, uh, the sense of ownership and identity that people have and how this gets expressed by the language, the way, it's, uh, the way it is made visible and how others have control over it. Uh, ideas of fairness and so on. We had a couple of diversions in discussing uh, the nature of competitions. Uh, who has access to these things and who has the, the, the power or the authority to make judgments about things and on what criteria and so on. There's quite a lot of conversation about access to a channel that gives you presence in an environment. So again, the idea of privilege and access to a voice is very much evident here where we have the opportunity to sit here. In the third uh, session, we focused quite a lot on forms of activism, of engagement, and what does this mean uh, in practice? So how do we affect change? What are different modes of doing this? How can we learn from other fields where issues of inclusion and diversity have been active for quite some time? That is something that I have to say that the type and typography world is fairly uh, often oblivious about, that a lot of the problems that concern us have been uh, the subject of intense debate and thought by other communities elsewhere, and we lose if we don't open our eyes and take advantage of all the work that's been done there, especially in recent years. And we really thought it was extremely important to recognize the perspective of local uh, voices, the users from their point of view. Again, to avoid replacing one set of terms with another set of terms that s simply just continue to reflect uh, a centralized approach to this. 
our resolutions uh, were shaped towards going uh, towards this recognition of the local and how things are being used locally. Uh, this threw in the air, for example, the problem that the term non-Latin is actually used much less than we would think anywhere outside the Anglophone sphere. That in other parts of the world, this is not used at all. Uh, if you go in China or Korea or Japan, people not even refer to Latin, they might refer to English as text and so on, which gives you insights into different trajectories of local histories of culture and so on. So I think a greater awareness and openness to how the local perspective of use uh, happens is something that I think is the, number, the first responsibility. Then the idea that responsibility is positive, it must involve action, it must involve some effort to change and a conscious reflection on the terms we use, the way we interact with people and the way we reflect on what we say to make the effort to do things differently and to recognize that the way we've been doing things might carry quite a few echoes of, sort of misplaced decisions. And I have to say, as anybody who is around my generation and older, we carry all the weight of decades where a lot of these concerns were not even registered in our education or formative years. So it has to be a very conscious, uh, sometimes challenging uh, process. Uh, and then we think that this needs to be something that emphasizes agency, emphasizes the responsibility of people to talk uh, with a lot of conviction about uh, the need to do things differently and have the sensitivity to do this differently depending on the audiences we are talking to, recognizing that perhaps you, you need to address these things differently with your client or your students or an institution and so on. Uh, we also think that this should be something that has continuity, that, uh, that we come back to. Not that, oh, we did a nice panel, we actually spent the equivalent of, you know, 25 person hours doing this. Uh, okay, what now? Let's go home. But we set in motion some sort of uh, periodic review of where we are ourselves, first of all. How do we rewrite uh, our curricula? How do we rewrite the way we refer to things in our teaching environments, in our practices, and so on? And as much as possible, open this process up, because by showing how we ourselves begin to change our own practice, that might also help and inspire others to do this. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm, I'm missing out in terms of introduction. Uh, am I, I'm good. Uh, so I've tried to summarize, I think I've been more soft. I think the, the strength of views uh, perhaps was stronger when we were discussing. We were, we, I think we were a little bit careful maybe in the first talk and then in the second one when we realized this typography thing, this type of thing, really taps into a lot of other concerns. Uh, the issue of identity in most uh, environments is actually quite complex, very layered, and it needs to bring a lot of concerns with. You do need to understand local conditions of use, how the local society works, economy works, who has access to uh, even having uh, a voice uh, locally as well as internationally in this. Uh, so I think we identified almost many more dimensions than we thought at the beginning. Uh, I'm pretty sure we sort of managed to come up with something that has already, uh, I think, given us food for thought. I say this because I've been writing next year's uh, curriculum right now, and I'm conscious of how I have to use different terms when I'm writing things. Uh, and I thought I was reflective already, but this experience opened up a completely different way of reflection. Uh, so maybe this is a good way to open up the conversation. Uh, in terms of how, the, how our exchanges uh, maybe you think feel left a mark on you or uh, are you going to take them forward? Okay, I'll go. <laughs> um, I, I think 100%, I think um, it, it's not very easy to change the terminology that we've been using for a very long time. And in fact, I think for me, what was more interesting to understand in those conversations is that there is no direct translations. Like, it's not that we'll say, oh, let's not say non-Latin anymore, and let's say X. We couldn't find that one word, because what we realized is that the term non-Latin is actually used for very different things. And this is where we started identifying, okay, if you want to say, 
if you want to say to speak about specific writing systems, then speak, enumerate them, talk about them, uh, say what they are. If you are talking about a specific, uh, like as you said, is it alphabetic or is it an abstract? Like mention it as well. Um, and we also identified uh, scenarios where. Sometimes you want to exclude the Latin, and this is where, for example, we were discussing about Grantian and the fact that it is a competition where we discuss about writing systems that are not Latin, and how do we refer to that? I don't think we have a solution for, for all of them, and maybe some of them have more than one solution as well that is also very uh, correct. For me, what was interesting was that the term non-Latin, it starts with a negation. It's something that is not Latin, and this is the, the wrong way to see it. So I think we can, if we understand where we use it, then we can find a way to change it. To Eleni's point about um, not having a one-on-one -on -one translation, whenever I feel overwhelmed that the answer isn't easy or isn't obvious, I go back to Fanon's writing, and there's a particular quote that I think is really meaningful to me, and he says that, colonization was a process of disorder, and so will decolonization be. And it's okay to be uncomfortable for a very long time when you're asking hard questions um, for hard answers. Um, and also the other thing that I think that I found useful, because I'm fairly new to type research, um, is that apart from the fact that non-Latin starts with the negation, it's also sometimes just unproductive, the same way that being called, like identity politics is unproductive. Like I am only seen as brown in a white institution, but I don't see myself as a brown. I occupy a very specific uh, nexus of position as a cis, het, Muslim, Sunni, Pakistani woman. And though that is a meaningful way to talk about me. But when you say brown, I have no idea. There's even amongst people of color, there's no solidarity based on color alone. There are fissures of caste, ethnicity, religion, so, gender, so many different things. And so a word like non-Latin obfuscates more than it reveals. And just intellectually lazy, I suppose, sorry. Too hard. That connects to a section in our first conversation where we thought, oh, maybe we need something like an acronym, uh, because there's fashionable acronyms like BIPOC and so on, uh, and which we very quickly shot down because they are essentially a, a kind of uh, gentrifying a form of discrimination. And again, I think this is something that we do need to be aware of, that it, it other, there's many ways of othering a community in the writing system, and uh, it can be done by appearing to be respectful, but the first point of the respect would be to recognize its diversity and that it is just as impossible to succinctly capture something with one word term as it would be to capture our own identities. Indeed, each one of us would be offended if somebody just called us X, Y, or Z, and we thought, oh, hold on, but actually I've got this kind of trajectory, this kind of multiplicity in my identity, there's this intersectionality in how I perceive myself. Uh, and that's a starting point for saying, if I expect that kind of respect for me, then how do I apply it to someone else? And I think very quickly thought, this shouldn't be a one-to-one -one thing. It's abolishing one term, but replacing it with a different behavior, which would be enumerating things, spell the thing out, take the take the effort to write the extra words or say the thing and be clear. And if somebody gives you this a collective term in the conversation, say, I presume what you mean is da 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 and so on. And yes, it's, it has a little bit of friction at the beginning, it's a bit difficult and so on, but I think people do change. And at, at the end of the day, also it can be a little bit of an evolutionary process in this that we will try different uh, approaches to this, and then we might be surprised that some of them actually catch, over, catch on quite quickly, because I think there is quite a lot of awareness in a, a very wide audience that a lot of the language we use and a lot of our attitudes are essentially out of date and bankrupt. And maybe the frustration and the anger we see online is because people can't find an easy answer to this. Uh, and beginning to show positive examples of action is just enough to start shifting the trend a bit. Others, there's a very big screen with you in front of us, so I don't know if you can see us. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, I mean, like I agree with, uh, I agree with what Abira said, 
and uh, uh, I think uh, firstly I just want to rephrase this conversation by saying that when Indian or any other type designer uh, sort of points out the blind spots in the discourse, we're not attributing some sort of malevolence to the designers from the 50s and 60s. Like, let me address this concept of white fear right out of the gate. Like, this, we're not coming to get you. I'm literally in a box on a screen behind you. I cannot come and get you. So this is not a this is not us coming with pitchforks trying to exact revenge. Like, there was no malevolence, and we acknowledge that. But I think what we need to understand is that, like the preface that you provided to us for this conversation, I think I hope that the last time that we need that preface, because I think we're all with the program right now. We, like, at least Indian type designers have been on board and have been saying this. Uh, I mean, the earliest instance of this I know is in 2005, where people have voiced uh, that the term non Latin is almost nonsensical and extremely pejorative. And, um, and we've also expressed that there is a need for more specificity in the way we use our language. And I, I do hope that uh, uh, we sort of uh, were able to just, uh, I mean, like I, I remember like even uh, when we do research, there's, there's always a demand on being specific uh, with not just a terminology, but, but with what we're referring to. And I remember like the constant uh, sort of uh, demand from the faculty is to constantly ask why, what, and dig deeper. And I think if in our general discourse, we can dig deeper and just be more specific about what we're referring to in terms of scripts, cultures, um, identities, like Abira said, uh, I think it would just be beneficial and much more um, knowledge generating. Uh, in terms of a discourse. And secondly, I also want to preface uh, another thing, which is uh, when I say we, uh, at, at present, I still see fairly privileged designers who are on this panel. We're all privileged that we're still here. I mean, there's a lot of people who design fonts in the country, as well as uh, like, like a lot of people who are not considered real designers, who have this moniker of you know, not producing real fonts because somehow we didn't acknowledge them in our discourse enough. Uh, so I do want to acknowledge that this is an extremely privileged circle. So we're just standing around in a circle, sort of discussing uh, or intellectualizing the terminology of a topic. But I think uh, the repercussions of this uh, can be felt on people who are rarely represented in the discourse. Yeah. Um. There was something that um, during our conversations that Adarsh said that uh, I thought was very interesting, where I, I think it was you, so sorry if it wasn't, uh, but one of us uh, said that very often as type designers, we stand up and we say, oh yes, uh, I know I shouldn't be saying non-Latin, but non-Latin. So I, I think this is where we need to, uh, because and also we started thinking of when do people that are not type designers how how do they get exposed to that terminology because i i receive emails from our clients that says oh we are now interested on in developing the non latins for this typeface how how did they come up with that term where did they read it um and and so i don't think we could find the root of where they get exposed to it for the first time but we can definitely find the solution of not echoing back that terminology or from our side when we want to use that term to really think what we want to say and, and, and find, I think, as you said, Jerry, like maybe there is no one solution, but if we all try, maybe we will come up with something that actually we hadn't thought of. I think where do they find it? Just realize uh, that for us, what, 20 years until recently, we were, um, I was part of the TDC non-Latin advisory board, which goes back to the beginning of the 20, of 21st century. And each year produces a book that has sort of graphic design towards the front and non-Latin bits at the back and so on. Uh, and I think that stuff is produced in good faith. And at the time, often that kind of reflection of discourse has, has no, no space to happen. But then that thing goes on the shelves of an agency. And then someone says, oh, I'm going to look at some good designs. And well, hmm. if some authority that I respect because publishes this book refers to it that way, then maybe that's the way I refer to it. And then we, look, um, we looked at uh, Brinker's book, 
in the first talk. And I, I, I say this because it's just been translated lots of languages and I could identify a heading that had the words non-Latin in it so I could find the equivalent in other languages. And as far as I could see, the translators had done exactly the same thing because in the language they were translating, Brinker's also useful because it's done many years back, there wasn't a term that they could use and probably didn't feel the confidence to use a much longer expressions. They said, oh, I'm just going to say things that not of the Latin. So often small actions uh, might have quite significant consequences which then get embedded. Then that thing, Brinker's in particular, is a source for other translators because it was the first one in the language. So I'm going to also do, I don't know, a Greek or a Korean or whatever text. That one is a translation that will have the terms in. I'm going to look them up. So a lot of inadvertent small actions create this, this wave then of practice that of course then the students will see and agents will see and so on. So maybe the first action is that us in our online posts and blogs and competitions and everything, we make sure that we audit all our language and go back and change wherever we can something to recognize first of all uh, that we need to spell things out we need to be specific and in a positive attribution rather than sort of allow things to, to continue there. Uh, and it is also not a bad idea for things that we are producing uh, or referring to in print uh, to add writers. The same way we do for a lot of our literature when we collect students say, this is useful to read for this, but actually not for this, or be careful because it represents that view, to say the terminology in this reflects something written you know, 30 years ago you should consider this or reflect on how it is used and so on. So I think we do need to take the trouble to reflect us and then translate this into action in every point that we touch people who possibly come into contact with this. There was a question from the online audience. Okay. Adash, what do you think about Indian, the term or name Indian? No, that was the... Uh, I mean, the term Indian, is, if it refers to a ge geography, uh, uh, I mean, that itself, uh, when you refer to historical artifacts, it, it's contentious. But um, this search for what is an Indian identity itself is quite futile and facile, because um, there is no such thing as a unified Indian identity. Like everyone's like, like, again, I would like to refer back to what Abira said, like everyone has like a very hyper specific um, identity and they operate within a very specific social milieu. I mean, if, how much ever we try to sort of speak on behalf of an us or a we or a they, it's impossible to capture the diversity. Uh, and the problem is, especially if I am put on the stage to answer this question, there's even more of a problem because um, it's, it's, I mean, it often happens that uh, elites usually capture most of such uh, identity politics discourse and it's really reflected or reflected back to minorities. So, um, yeah, my answer to the question is to sort of uh, invalidate in some sense the question itself. Okay, shall, shall we perhaps open to the audience? Or yes, because there... you're all yes. dying at least to get yes, this. Yes, I, I, I want to throw this. <laughs> uh, I've been listening to you. Yeah, you have to speak okay. into the box. Uh, yeah, that's the one, okay. yes. <laughs> yeah. That was yeah, yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you have to speak into that All right. black, so, black thing. And uh, yeah, that's the one. one. Perfect. Yeah. All right. So I was listening to you and, and uh, I kept asking myself, was there really any ill intent when they were called something non-Latin? Because to me, it feels like the problem, uh, and I'm Armenian, right? So my alphabet is not a Latin alphabet. So if somebody refers to Armenian as non-Latin, I'm not offended in any way. I mean, I don't think that I feel any, in any way inferior when somebody addresses my writing script uh, system as non-Latin. So uh, I think uh, there is the, probably the solution that could be very simple because if you speak about specific script, you just name the, the script the way it is. If it's an Armenian script, you say an Armenian script. If it's Telugu script, you call it Telugu, and that's the end of the story. Um, 
I, I'm curious whether you think that um, uh, from a point of view of uh, uh, being a minority, I'm feeling like there is something negative about the term, whether there is really substance here or not. Shall I Uh, for me, the question about non-Latin, um, when we argue for specificity, is not so much about my feelings and whether I feel offended or I feel inferior. And to be honest, it's not even as much an intellectual question, um, though of course hyper-specificity is always in intellectually more rigorous and therefore more productive. But um, Adarsh also made this point um, one, in one of our conversations, so Adarsh, feel free to add into it later. But when we are specific, it can, in our language and the words we use, to my understanding, I think we open up the possibility for making a material change in the lives of people that have been disenfranchised in multiple different ways. So if just because we sit here and decide that we don't want to use non-Latin anymore is meaningless, but being hyper-specific can allow us to make material changes. So others, please add to it. But one of the examples that um, we were discussing in our in our conversations was that when you have a Tamil typeface, instead of just saying non-Latin, when you say Tamil, the next question is, okay, but where did you get the, that? Where was it inspired from? Was it inspired from some street letting in Chennai? And then there's another level of hyper-specificity. And then you think, oh, but what was the letterer artist who did that? And then you're like, oh, actually, Actually, my typeface that is not, it was not actually inspired, but is in a kind of a direct conversation with that lettering artist. Maybe that's a collaboration. Maybe there should be some kind of material compensation. And therefore, then you are just allowing yourself to be more accountable to the process. And that is why I think hyperspecificity is more important. So not just feelings, but making material changes in the lives of people. Um, yeah, and please others add to it because it was mostly the point that you made. No, I mean, uh, you've just said everything that uh, that I could have said about it. I mean, just to answer in jest, uh, uh, if like if I had to like uh, make a sort of casual analogy to this, it's uh, it's it's not offensive, like you said, um, but uh, it's nonsensical, um, and it's it's akin to me saying my name is Adarsh Rajan, but you just yelling in my direction and saying John. And uh, I'm not going to really tilt my head towards you, but if you keep yelling, I'm going to have to, and that's inconvenient. So I think, and I wouldn't know what you're talking about. So I think it's more about just, just understanding um, what I'd like to be called, what I'd like to be referred as, and then being referred to as that specific term. I can chip in on this, because uh, we know from the the context at which non-Latin uh, was imagined, uh, it was neutral and with very good rationale and good intentions. But non-Latin is a diversion because in my mind it's a transition term. It was invented for a technology that was very Anglo-centric, and I say Anglo because not Eurocentric, because uh, it wasn't really taking care of the Germans or the Czechs or the Poles and so on. It was just for English, American English, not even full literary English. <laughs> no, 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 that's a very clear. Uh, look at the commercial typewriter. That's what most typesetting systems are involved on. West Coast uh, technology is based on commercial American typewriters. Uh, and that technology has a sort of a late Victorian route. It gets evolved during the 20th century, gets translated into phototypesetting machines, which are very much developed primarily for an Anglo-centric text generating workflow, uh, then they have to be distinguished as O4, us and non-Latin, because we have to hack them somehow to add umlauts or to add accents or to somehow do maybe just one kind of Cyrillic. Yeah? Uh, and then we have an environment now where we're saying we have systems that can do a multitude of languages and writing systems, not very well. Yeah? But the underlying assumptions of them are not from the period when we had this transition from exotics and orientals to non-Latins. That was just an intermediate hop. The underlying assumptions for pretty much all of the technology we use to uh, enter text, read text, produce text, is all based on very Anglo-centric and narrow Anglo-centric ideas of what texts look like and how they compose. That's why if you look at Facebook in Arabic, the alignments are all over the place. 
That's why Hebrew is such a pain in the ass to typeset, because it was, it's a hack of systems that were developed for fairly simple left to right hyphenating texts. So non-Latin is a diversion in the sense because the racism that was inherent in Orientals and exotics is very much still embedded in all the systems that assume a left to right phonetic system of arranging characters next to another, and then everything else is either an addition, if you've got a few more characters like the Poles do, or a hack of these if you have a very different writing system. So there is a longer history of discrimination there, and I think, think about non-Latin says, oh, hold on, okay, where do I apply this? Where are these typefaces being used in these systems that are very much still dematerialized interpretations of a typewriter? So I think the racism and the discrimination is all there, but it's sort of somewhere lower in the stack. It's in the bit that assembles the typefaces and says, no, you're a troublesome thing with odd characters and too many bits that I don't know what to do with, and I need to hack my system to make it work for yours. Uh, so it is odd that in 2022, we have presentations like Abira's. It is odd that we cannot do smooth, uh, bi-directional typesetting with very easy interfaces. It is odd that we still have people, we were talking earlier, who have to use Latin characters to phonetically transcribe their language. That is insulting on a level way more deep to their literature, their culture, the future of the people who are learning to ignore the script because they can just type their messages on uh, with a phonetic keyboard, with a Latin keyboard. Uh, but it happens at a level where we are too distant from this. So Adders' point about the access to having some voice of the people who are on the ground uh, is not too different from us here being witnesses to decisions being made in Microsoft and Google uh, about how our text will compose. And there we have zero agency, and our little world of type is just a little footnote in all of this. To continue your idea, I would like to talk a little bit about our experience in Armenia, because uh, before uh, becoming type designer and being involved in competitions and conferences, I actually never heard the term non-Latin, because uh, in Armenia, you know, all the publications, uh, pub pub publishing industry offers uh, also two other uh, writing systems, Latin and Cyrillic. Um, all uh, our uh, design and uh, marketing companies offer these two languages aside from uh, Armenia. So even though we don't have uh, um, an issue concerning the terminology uh, non-Latin, we have a major, major issue uh, in the actual rep representation of our, our typefaces because the majority of our contemporary typefaces are heavily influenced by Latin and uh, this brings a lot of uh, issues for us because um, uh, it makes uh, for us a difficult job uh, for the preservation of our uh, unique characteristics of, of our writing system. Um, yeah, I would like to add that. <laughs> uh, it is really encouraging to see that um, due to this type of uh, discussions, we can bring a wider attention to this kind of topics. And I think that is uh, what is the most important at the end of the day. And to just take off from that, uh, I'd also just like to uh, add that uh, this is uh, the term non-Latin uh, is uh, deeply, it, it's a Eurocentric problem. This is not a problem that's faced in our communities, at least in India, like uh, among the communities I work with, uh, we don't refer to scripts, uh, all our scripts as Indian. We've also stopped calling our scripts like North Indian or West Indian because a lot of it is just, uh, it, they're just, they're again like uh, unnecessary grouping and fairly unproductive terms. So I think um, uh, it's another reason for just having us just call it a script what it is, allows you to just focus on the value you can add to that particular script. Because I'm at my wits end to understand in what context would you want to group a script like Chinese, Armenian, and Tamil, and Urdu, uh, because that's what non-Latin is referring to, as well as like an obscure, uh, forgotten script. So, I mean, these are, which is why like having 
much more specific terms, just calling a script by its name would allow for designers to just add more value to that particular script. So I'm not a non-Latin type designer. I'm not an Indian type designer. I always preface, I always introduce myself as a Tamil type designer because that's the script I focus on. And so that way I am in a position to add value to my script in a particular way. No, sorry, I just wanted to, to add that I feel it's also more easy to scale things. Um, for example, I would never say, let's develop the non-Greek typefaces. Would, would never do that because, yeah, it, it's just... Uh, You're almost begging me to say... Please develop the Greek. <laughs> I know, but like this is where we realize why it's very centered around one writing system. Um, and it's also not scalable because... I don't know, what if one day, for example, let's say the, uh, the Grandshan competition also stops judging Greek because we've judged enough Greek. Would we say the non-Latin and the non-Greek competition? We wouldn't do that. We would say, we would start actually naming the writing system. So I think it's also non-scalable to have that term. But I think that's exactly the, about what we are speaking. You can understand me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, I like the idea that non-Latin is a transition term uh, because there was a problem, uh, an issue, like you said, okay, there's exotic or oriental, and then we need something, we needed something new. As we started with the Grandjean competition in 2007, done by EDIC, uh, it was not that concentrated on, I don't know what I have to say now. <laughs> Probably non-Latin. <laughs> it was concentrated not on something because it was there was Latin and Greek, and Cyrillic, and some Armenia for sure, uh, and some more. And then we tried to find something would help us that there is that you can understand for what this competition stand. <laughs> and for me, it's still the same problem. I understand completely. There is somebody who is focused on Tamil, for sure. There's somebody others who's focused on Armenian. There's somebody others who is doing multi-script. But if you are thinking that it's really necessary that we will have a focus on things that is not dominated by the American way of thinking, we could be probably say non-American typefaces. <laughs> yeah. I'm still looking for something what is helpful to have a brand where you understand with a very short name what is this for what it stand. Global. Yeah, but global is everything all the time. And, I, and multi script I, is, yeah, uh, but there's always Morris. included, but there's always included Latin. Why not? I mean, when we're talking about languages, we have the term foreign languages. And I suppose the term foreign languages is felt acceptable by everyone. Why not just say foreign scripts? But it's foreign it's to foreign you. Languages. Yes, that, but that's exactly where it gets interesting. As soon as you've got a person who says it, and you know the person, you know what foreign scripts means. And if you have a local organization, like the Munich Typographic Society, if they do something on foreign scripts, it would be clear as well. So I don't, I don't see why it shouldn't work at all, considering that the term foreign languages surely works. And unless you are a non-German living in Munich. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's not, it's not for, then for me, German is the foreign. I, I, think, I think it goes but, back to... Yes, but for you, but... But, you, I, so, I, but if I lived here, I would be a member of the TGA or but, the TGM, right? But, uh, so, uh, but, but, no, are you, but are you saying that the term foreign languages doesn't work? Uh, I, w I would look, for example, at language teachers who use uh, English as a second language, for example, in to, uh, to describe how do they teach people to learn English as a second language. 
uh, not as a foreign language. So Sorry, yeah, I asked you, you, are, you say, are, you saying that the word, are you saying that the term foreign languages when talking about languages doesn't work, yes or no? Sorry, but I who decides uh, what we, uh, we mean by saying foreign la language? Mm -hmm. Who decides uh, what is foreign language considered? Like, uh, if uh, Armenian uh, is foreign for you, uh, it's not foreign for me, and uh, so on. I, I, I think to, to the, the point of Boris, I think we have identified that. That's why we said there is no direct translation because sometimes you need to exclude a writing system. I, I, don't, I don't think we disagree on that. I think it's more... Foreign language without Latin. We had something like old but Latin or... I mean, in some situations... I, I, I think just... Um, I feel it's hard to come up with one solution and each one of us in what we do in our daily life, we have different ways where we use non-Latin. So I think this is where each group then needs to think like in education or with our clients or in research or how we refer to our peers. How do we do that? I think this is where we basically need to, there is no direct solution. We don't want to also give a solution. Yeah, let's come a bit, because there's a box there. Uh, yeah, Nadine. Hi, thank you. Um, if I may answer Boris uh, for the question. So I'm a big proponent of not using the word non-Latin, uh, mainly because it's a reflection of a 19th century point of view based in Europe, where Europe is the core, everybody else is the periphery, and liberty, democracy, all of it applies in the core, and shit applies everywhere else. So uh, in this case, it takes the point of view of the main most important point of view is being in Latin, and that's why everybody else is the non-Latin. So we don't use it, we don't like it. But anyways, the solution in such a case, because we need to recognize that what Granchen is trying to do is to bring equity to scripts that have been ignored, and type designers who have not had um, you know, access to education, et cetera, et cetera. So in this case, we need to recognize that they were non-Latin, and it's the fact that they were lumped as non-Latin that's the problem. So I would leave non-Latin, but put it between quotations, you know? Because you are trying to right okay. an injustice, and in such a case, I would be comfortable, if, if that makes sense. Okay. But, okay. Yeah. Uh, Jose, uh, throw, throw. Good idea, the book. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was just wondering why not just leave it off and still not judge Latin. People are going to notice once they want to hand in or people are going to notice once they research Granjan. Why not just leave it off? Because there's other scripts you might not be able to judge because you would like to judge them, but you don't have the judges for it or there's not enough of an educational context there or whatever reason there might be. So there is a precedent for other scripts not being included in Granjan. Why give Latin the sort of center stage for it. Just ignore it, and Latin designers are going to find another competition to hand something in. OK, uh, sorry for this. I, I, un I understand you completely, but uh, the idea of Granchan was to widen the scripts step by step. We don't have done it the last five years, but before, we, already, we started only with Cyrillic, Armenian and, and, and uh, Greek. And then we widen it. Because to do such a competition on a high level where the communities will enter some new typefaces in their script and to find judges on a high level so that this will be, kind of, will be combined on a high level, you have to do it step by step. The next one what we will do is Japan. Uh, but it's not easy because it's a very closed community and I had a lot of discussions with them and we will do it, but it needs time. So, uh, in general, it's, Ranjan is open for everything without Latin. <laughs> That's the idea. Yeah? But don't say that. I mean, I, sorry, I completely agree, name? but just don't put it in the name, put it in the, you know, postscript or something on the bottom. I just... <laughs> okay, okay. Exactly. Hold on, we've got... Uh, Jose, was uh, Jose was there. Yeah. If you hit him on the head, it double points. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
we, we need need to have a basket up there and you know we know what we can do um so um i will do uh one of my favorites that is being rude to the people inviting you <laughs> um i don't think that we should focus the discussion on on how grandsham can Mm. can really of course, yeah. fix a communication problem that is quite unique. Yeah, yeah, of course. Quite unique. That wasn't the idea. To me, it it is part of the same discussion that we have when categorizing typefaces. There is not a single solution because we need to take into consideration who we are talking to. So if um, I'm talking with this crowd here, when I guess that most of us are either type designers, typographers, or graphic designers very much interested in typography, I could use a set of categories that is super specific, as Abira is uh, trying to, to, to propose. Now, if I am talking to one of my clients, I cannot use this very same set of categories because they wouldn't understand me. So. I think that, yes, it is a communication problem, and that I think the term non-Latin is, is bad in every possible sense. Um, when it comes to communication, I would try to switch it for something that has a positive attitude, like Boris was you know, suggesting just a couple of minutes ago. But then we need to try to find ourselves how we separate these groups of writing systems into categories that are, are that make sense for each one's each one of the different groups of people that will be receiving this message and that, that is my point of view so can i can i add something to this i think Jose uh, kind of pointed out uh, uh, that uh, i don't know if by mistake or by purpose but uh, that the big thing where this uh, actually problem and what propels the term non Latin is actually marketing and marketing of mm. type foundries. And um, yes, I'm not saying it's the only problem, but that's some, certainly something that, uh, as you were saying, like communicating to the clients and it's relatively, I think, easy, maybe not easy, but uh, easier for us to change this discussion, but how to actually educate clients and um, stop calling it like like it to them it's f for example if i'm going to say to some uh, to my client oh yeah i'm going to des uh, to design an latin thing uh it's going to be like okay so i can get to this guy with five different scripts and he's going to at least find me a contact but if i'm going to say uh, yeah right but sorry just just i and i, I will put uh, give you right now um the, the thing is that it creates um problems in different levels because um, the client will tell you uh, I want an Arabic typeface and what they need is to speak Persian or Urdu or a language. So sometimes when you speak to a client you need to be much more specific from a ge geographic or, or linguistic point of view and not from the point of view of the writing system. Uh, only two words. I think the new typography is number. I am number. Your mob is number. Number is uh, in all language, in all typography, correct. What is? <laughs> the, okay, so it's okay that the United States has 001 as, an area, as a country code? Yes. No. <laughs> Maybe my culture should have the one because we were older. <laughs> and I can have an argument with the Chinese about whether we should have the one in the country code or they should have the one. There's a choice again. There's always a hierarchy and there's a power there. So I think it just shifts it to something else. I, I think recognizing that there is a constant set of biases in everything that we do, and that's normal because we are limited in our ability to comprehend and understand and learn. Uh, and the only response is to take everything that we do as temporary and under constant revision. And the more privileged we are, the more we need to err towards this active reflection and activism, uh, the more hungry I am. Really, I, I don't have time for that. I think that that's the continuum there. But if I am right now, 
not being bombed, or I have a salary at the end of the month that will feed my kids, then I have to cash that privilege somehow, and the way I do it is to reflect on my condition. Uh, and maybe be angry that Greek, that is you know, part of, sort of the West, culturally, uh, it is not fantastical. It's nowhere near as complex as we're doing as the league, still cannot get displayed properly online. Right? And uh, why do Georgians have to argue to have a third case? Uh, and it has to take so long to solve a lot of problems. Why does Type Together have to publish a book that says, oh, look at all the different way uh, quotes are used in alphabets, and none of these works properly in a browser. So I think we are really quite primitive in seeing the full diversity of our expression being expressed in the machines that we use to communicate. And the more I think about it, the more angry I am. And this is odd, because I'm getting older, so... <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm doing... So I've started milder, I'm getting angry as I get older. But I think because I have expectations. When I was young, I didn't really know what was going on. I, I mentally I sort of knew where Korea is, but it, was a, it could be a different planet. In the 70s, I couldn't go to Korea. Now, I've been there a few times, I know people from there, and it is really annoying frustrating, angering, that simple things of exchange of people who go about their daily business have to be done with constant compromises as to their expression, expression of their literary uh, verbal culture. And especially because pretty much every other culture other than the Northwestern Anglo-centric culture is way deeper. And you don't need to have a culture that goes back three and a half thousand years to see the complexities. I mean, if you're Polish, your language has changed tens of times in the last 500 years alone. How does that get represented? Where's the spelling dictionary that changes depending on the region of Poland? German, we're in Germany. What is Germany 200 years ago? A, a collection of many different dialects and languages. Why do we have one spelling dictionary? And that stuff is pretty fundamental. And I think entry points like this conversation on Latin lead only to this wider anger and frustration at how complacent we are at putting up with that stuff, but then I still have to go home and sort of write emails in a thing that assumes I'm writing American English. And I don't know the answer to this, other than just get angry. Okay, I have the box. Um, <laughs> uh, Grand Chan, in my opinion, has kind of a, I mean, it's not a coincidence that we're sitting here and discussing this, kind of an authority on that term, I feel. And I was just, uh, I just wanted to say that as for the type design conference, that maybe it could evolve from its 2007 concept and include Latin and just call it global type design uh, competition and limit the, the entries per script. And yeah, and I feel like it will lose nothing of its identity as, as a non-Latin, as a global type design competition. Uh, Ali at the back. I wanted to react <laughs> to what Yannan said, <laughs> but I give the. No, no, go, go, go. Um, yeah, I think even global is problematic. Actually, uh, I couldn't live in a world where I where I am called a non-man or a human. I want to be called a woman. Like I couldn't live in a world where the where I would be like a non cis hetero. I want to be like a queer woman. I, I want to be n in some kind of general mysterious enough category that is not defined by what is oppressive. And so, yeah, I would like a, a word that replaces non-Latin and that could like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's it. Global is not. I just, not uh... I just want to address the whole concept of this. Uh, I feel like a lot of people believe that uh, in countries that do use their own scripts, uh, that we somehow don't use Latin. Latin is an inexplicable part of our environment. Uh, in fact, you probably cannot compose uh, a lot of even Tamil texts these days uh, without the use of at least Latin numerals or um, uppercase initials in names. So. Uh, I 
yeah i do i don't understand like how excluding latin helps either because it is definitely a fabric of typographic scenery um, in india uh, secondly i just wanted to address this concept of equity i i hope um, we're not uh, mistaking this conversation on equality with equity like this has nothing to do with equity we're just sitting in a room and discussing what we're supposed to call each other uh, we're not actually discussing how we're supposed to redistribute resources uh, to actually help people in other countries so um i think this conversation has nothing to do with equity equity it's uh, it, i mean equality is a bare minimum conversation and i, I feel like uh, this is uh, it, it is largely sort of materially inconsequential Truly inconsequential. Uh, I only want to say that we have come to an end now for this discussion, for now, not for every time, because we are more than one hour now and we are a little bit late. But there is one more. Yeah, there's, there's the more. corner. I think there are two more, and then I give over to you, Jerry, to okay. make a little conclusion. Okay. Can, um, can we go right at the corner, which was first before you, Diego? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, and thank you. Hold on to that, yeah. Mm, I don't have a solution, I only have two thoughts. So we are now in 21st century, and we are still playing the games of 19th century, and still dividing something, some part, some scripts into groups. So maybe there is a time for new strategic or orientation of, of names in this way. Um, and also, if I uh, think further, by setting the word non-Latin in English, like for example, I'm coming from a small country, uh, like a small language, so we are going to use direct translation, like non-Latin, ne, latinic ne. So maybe there is a time for new words or setting not English words for this group if we need or scripts that we need in order to have the same word throughout the whole world, for example. Because also, for example, using variable font, then in my country, we only use variable font. So maybe there is time for use, for also work on our, I don't know, termin terminology in order to be worldwide the same and not then used from English language. So yeah, maybe there's a time for new ways. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I'm, I completely agree with the term that is, is, is transitional. We are going to a new place right now. Um, but I think like maybe there are so many things overlapping right now in this, in this specific topic because we got something like maybe with colonialism on one hand, on the other hand, we got something like uh, a bad management of globalization. Um, so for instance, for me, I'm from Latin America, so I think I don't fit into this conversation, but I will say like, for instance, the printing machine arrived to Latin America, to Peru, in order to promote an ideology. So that is something like colonialism does, like you are promoting an ideology and you're getting colonized, obviously. Um, whereas I think in this case is because there is a bad management of globalization and technologies, which also like um, create the same consequences, like people feel underrepresented, communities feel like underrepresented uh, by this um, terminology. But I, I would like to say that um, we have to take it, easy on, take it easy on this because maybe avoid to to fall into this moral superiority which is like i don't like it like you are saying it wrong or you're right like it's very like you're wrong or you're right so it's like i think is it has so many um how do i say um matices i don't know to say in english but it has so many levels so i think we have to just take it easy i think is transitional, so maybe don't feel bad if you're talking to a client, say, no, Latin, the guys, 
most likely he's going to understand you. I mean, it depends on the context. That's what I'm trying to say. So, and I think we also got this other issue because this is so niche that we can we, we can make awareness of political stuff, which I was thinking like maybe this is a solution, but. So, so we have to, you know, to try to avoid like this moral superiority and just go easy with this. That, that's it. Thank you. Okay, it's again yours <laughs> to make a uh, like to make, some, make some last words, please. Please. Um, I personally, I do not care what we call it. You can call it anything you like at all, so long as it ends up in a material redistribution of wealth. That is my stance on it. So for me, this is absolutely not an intellectual question, only a question if it allows us to think about the ways in which resources are allocated. Final words? Wow. <laughs> I think we've wrapped it up uh, quite a lot. I think for me, I. Uh, I'm a person that I've used wrong terminology in the past, and I think I, 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 as a human I will always be, but I am always trying to get better and to get more inclusive and to change, and it's not always very easy. I sometimes forget it and I sometimes use the wrong terminology, but the more I, I train myself to think about it this way, the more I, I feel I understand not the, not the problem of the word, but what that word actually means and uh, the impact it has on others. Okay. That's a good, <laughs> good Diana, do you want to say something? I just wanted to add that I think that uh, today we were discussing not only in the scopes of Gran Shan about the terminology, but um, outside as well. So not being so concentrated only on the, the title of Gran Shan. No, that, that was not the idea. <laughs> Uh, I mean, yeah, decolonization is not a metaphor. It's uh, it's actually a call to action. And unless there's action, I mean, we can, I can, I can be on Zoom. I can be on various Google Meets all day long, and we'll still reach nowhere unless there's actually a redistribution of resources. Yeah. All right. That's a perfect point. I think to leave it. Yes. Sure. So thank you very much. <laughs>